Thank you very much, uh, Clara. And um, as uh, she mentioned, my name is Randy Pablo. I should have uh, started perhaps uh, with that. I'm a professor uh, in uh, the Faculty of Law and uh, uh, autrefois director of the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. And it's my pleasure to um, uh, welcome you today and to uh, situate this talk as part of one of the main uh, lecture series run by the Center for Human Rights. Uh, on a uh, regular basis, uh, this being the John Humphrey Lecture. John Humphrey was a professor uh, at the Faculty of Law uh, here at uh, McGill. And uh, we, we recall um, most of all his uh, central contribution to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which, uh, he, uh, of which he authored the very first uh, draft on the basis of the UN committee um, uh, working under the direction of Eleanor Roosevelt to uh, produce what became a central document for international human rights law. And if you're ever curious, McGill has uh, the archives of the sequential drafts of the declaration with John Humphrey's um, handwritten annotations. A very interesting document. To consider. Uh, in 1988, to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Universal Declaration adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1948, uh, the, the Faculty of Law at McGill decided to create the Humphrey Lecture uh, series. And the first speaker was John Humphrey uh, himself. And he's been followed over the years by many uh, people, including. Uh, Javier Perez de Cuellar, the former um, uh, United Nations uh, Secretary General, uh, Salia Goumeri, a well-known legal anthropologist, uh, Abdullahi Al-Naim, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, luminaries in the conversation about cultural diversity and uh, human rights, uh, John Burroughs, and many others. And we are very lucky today to add to uh, this uh, illustrious list with three justices from uh, the Special Jurisdiction uh, for Peace, or the HEP, in uh, Colombia, established pursuant to the 2016 peace agreement between the FARC and the government of um, Colombia, and which has been at work uh, since then, or not quite since then, but uh, since. Uh, a short while after that, to attempt to steer uh, Colombia towards a uh, more peaceful and less violent um, um, transition to justice uh, and to peace, uh, which has proven, as we will hear, enormously difficult for a, a range of reasons that converge in uh, making the challenge 
of transitional justice enormously challenging in uh, Colombia. So we have, uh, as I mentioned, three justices. Uh, uh, Justice uh, Oscar Para Vera, uh, who um, is a, uh, a fellow graduate from Oxford University uh, from the Center for Criminology and Criminal uh, Justice, um, is a lecturer at uh, the National University of Columbia, worked uh, for the Inter-American uh, Court of Human Rights and as well at the American Inter-American Commission on uh, Human Rights, and he's contributed also to the uh, UN Committee on Enforced Dis Disappearances. Then uh, Justice Sumara Balantra Moreno, uh, uh, Dr. Balantra, Mo Balantra Moreno uh, has a PhD in uh, law from uh, Rey Juan Carlos University in Spain, a master's from Notre Dame University in uh, the United States, and is a graduate of uh, Universidad Andina Simón Bolívar uh, in Ecuador. Uh, she serves uh, in the Chamber for Amnesty or Pardon of uh, the JEP and previously was uh, the Vice President. Finally, uh, Justice Alexandra Sandoval Mantisha, uh, also a Justice at the Chamber <coughs> for Amnesty or Pardon of uh, the JEP, uh, was previously a lawyer for uh, an NGO, uh, Women's Link Worldwide, uh, worked for the uh, Conseil d'État of uh, the uh, uh, Colombian uh, state, and was also a lawyer at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in San Jose in Costa Rica. She's a graduate of Los Andes uh, University uh, in uh, Bogota, and uh, has uh, also a graduate degree from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. So I leave you in their hands for what I'm sure will be uh, an extremely rich but also an extremely important uh, conversation. Creo que nosotros en Canadá tenemos mucho que aprender de la experiencia colombiana y eso es oportunidad única de oírlo directamente desde Colombia. Por favor. Thank you so much. Very uh, briefly, I'll be uh, chairing the, uh, the panel. I'm Frederick Megra, I'm the uh, co-director of the Center for Human Rights Legal Tourism. Uh, we're actually delighted to have uh, the justices with us uh, tonight. And I want to acknowledge uh, Yuri Romana Rivas's uh, role in uh, triggering this, uh, this event, uh, part of a very strong contingent of uh, doctoral uh, students at the uh, uh, faculty from Columbia. And uh, we, we had, you know, wanted to do something of a kind uh, uh, for a while, but I think without uh, his creativity and, and uh, initiative, it wouldn't have happened. So I wanted to uh, thank him uh, for that initiative. Um, I would also wanted to say that, that uh, where uh, I think in some ways the situation in Colombia is not as known as it ought to be in Canada, uh, there's been a lot of uh, interest in transitional justice, certainly among uh, my students. Uh, but I think we, uh, you know, we, we were long overdue to have a sort of uh, thorough presentation on uh, what's been happening. I think it's really been the cutting edge of a lot of uh, transitional justice efforts. It's raised, you know, really fascinating uh, dilemmas, and that's why. We particularly look forward to uh, this evening's conversation. The uh, justices have uh, very kindly agreed to each give a 15-minute presentation on, on uh, uh, different aspects of the transitional justice process uh, uh, in uh, uh, Colombia, and then we'll open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, and so uh, Oscar uh, Paravera has uh, agreed to give us uh, kind of introductory overview of uh, uh, the, the special jurisdiction for peace and specifically something that is being closely associated with the prosecution of macro cases. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Well, uh, in this, um, uh, okay, firstly, uh, I would like to, um, to say thanks to Professor McGrath and to um, Julie Romagna to, uh, for this opportunity to, to be here. And thank you for the center for this opportunity to share some of uh, these ideas about the work of the Special Jurisdiction for Peace in Colombia. I would like to begin with this picture about uh, um, a hearing last year uh, when we can see uh, far leaders uh, in Colombia acknowledge full responsibility uh, regarding kidnappings in the context of the armed conflict in Colombia. <clears throat> and this is so important because it's the first time after a peace deal that uh, a guerrilla movement acknowledged responsibility for crimes against humanity after a peace process. And this is a very important uh, outcome of the special jurisdiction last year. And one question arises is uh, how how, uh, how did we get to this point uh, after five years of work? And as an introduction, I would like to say that we have in Colombia more than 50 years of uh, armed conflict, and it's an ongoing ar armed conflict that continues uh, until now. We have the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the FARC, and the National Liberation Army, ALN, currently in a uh, peace negotiation with the, the uh, current government in Colombia. And this is the two main guerrilla groups and obviously paramilitary groups uh, 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 around the armed conflict the, in the past decades. And as a starting point, we have to take into account a lot of victims uh, in, the mark, in the context of this armed conflict. More than 100,000 of uh, forced disappearances in Colombia more than 2,000 of victims of se sexual violence, more than 18,000 of uh, victims of recruitment of children, and more than 8 million of um, people uh, for in, con in the context of forced disappearances, uh, forced displacement, and the victims of kidnapping uh, arise to more than the 27,000 of um, victims and extrajudicial killings, uh, more than 6,000. And as a starting point for the work of the special jurisdiction, we have to put these questions to, to analyze the, this kind of uh, massive and systematic violence in the context of the armed conflict. In the context of the peace accords in 2016, one question uh, defines a lot of uh, uh, mechanisms uh, inside the special jurisdiction how to combine the effort to find justice for victims with the effort of achieving political settlement for an armed conflict. This is a key question to understand the design of the special jurisdiction for peace. Another starting point is the impossibility of amnesties regarding international crimes. In the past, uh, after a peace accord, uh, there is a lot of amnesties during the, the story of peace accords, the, and, but uh, after the, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, it's not possible to grant this kind of amnesties for international crimes. But at the same time, we have to think in the, the new role for the amnesty in the context of political crimes, in the, in the, in the context of a negotiation for peace. And these uh, ideas uh, explain uh, the special jurisdiction for peace as a new jurisdiction. Different to the ordinary jurisdiction in Colombia, it's not the ordinary system in the context of a system that is, uh, in the context of the negotiation, an enemy of one of the parts, the FARC uh, guerrilla. And the main objective of the special jurisdiction is the legal, legal closure of, for the armed conflict. And one point in the context of the agreement was the necessity to judge all the parties, all the armed uh, uh, parties uh, in the context of the uh, armed conflict. And because of that, the special jurisdiction is judging not only the FARC, but also the state and also the third parties 
also the uh, businessmen and business uh, uh, enterprises, the enterprises involved in human rights violations. And another uh, starting point uh, relevant for this discussion is the crea creation of a comprehensive system for truth, justice, and reparation, and, non and guarantees of non-repetition. It is important to take into account that we have in Colombia more than 20 years of discussions on transitional justice. And the balance is the necessity to use judicial mechanisms as the special jurisdiction and also extrajudicial mechanisms like the true commission or a special unit for, the, uh, 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 for looking at the, the uh, people um, disappeared uh, during the conflict. We can see here the, the structure of the special jurisdiction. We have uh, three justice chambers, and we have the, uh, a chamber for acknowledgement of truth, responsibility, and determination of facts and conducts. And this is the chamber uh, in which I, uh, I'm working now. The chamber for determination of legal situations with a specific focus in the work with the uh, armed forces, and a chamber uh, for amnesty and pardon. And also, we have a tribunal for peace. We can say that the justice chambers, in, sort of, in some way, is a kind of pretrial chambers uh, for a trial before the tribunal for peace, with a sex, with a same, um, we have a section of first instance in cases of lack of acknowledgement, a section of first instance in cases of um, no, in, in cases of acknowledgement, and we can see two kind of avenues in this uh, structure, and a, a, a path for people who are recognizing truth and committed to re to reparation, and another path for people who is disputing or who is in, uh, um, who will um, um, develop a, an adversarial path in the context of the administration of justice. And obviously an appeals section in this kind of um, structure. We have a, a specific prosecutor under, on, in the context of this structure for people who are not committed to recognize the full truth and the uh, possibility to, re to redress. One of the most important chambers is the Chamber for Amnesty and Pardon. And this chamber grants conditioned amnesties for, um, to former members of the FARC and their collaborators with regard to less serious crimes, the, the not international crimes. And also, this chamber grants conditioned interim release to former members, members of the FARC in particular cases not related to genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes. But um, I would like to focus in, in these uh, 10 minutes uh, in the uh, work of the Chamber of Acknowledgement of Responsibility. And I will explain the, uh, our work in macro-criminality and systematic, systemic crimes. The starting point is a new approach to um, prosecuting macrocriminality. And a first step in this new approach is to overcoming the case-by-case -case individual approach and proposing the, prosecu the prosecution of systemic crimes, macrocriminal patterns, and criminal plans uh, in the context of uh, the, the several examples of uh, uh, apparatus related to this kind of violence. And also the idea of the necessity of a, a strategy of prioritization by the uh, special jurisdiction. It means that we cannot work uh, in an es es investigation scheme on demand. We have to aggregate, accumulate a lot of facts in order to create a the strategy to prosecution the, this kind of macro criminality. And also, uh, we have to focus in unveiling, unveiling the main and highest criminal responsibilities. Um, one example in a, in a macro case that I will explain later, the majority of the ordinary justice uh, prosecute only soldiers. Only soldiers in a specific macro case, 
but we have to focus in the top officials, the generals, the colonels, and the, 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 the special high ranks in the chain of command of the army, for example. Because of that, we have 11 macro cases uh, uh, in the first five years of work of the special jurisdiction. And let me see one example of these micro, case, micro cases. Case number one is related to kidnappings in Colombia. War crime of hostage taking and crimes against humanity of severe deprivation of personal liberty and other kind of uh, international crimes committed by former FARC, FARC rebel group. It's a macro case because we can find almost uh, 20 years of kidnappings in Colombia with more than 20,000 of kidnappings, 9,000 of members of FARC involved, involved in this mega case, and the first indictment that we prepared uh, two years ago was against eight uh, of the leaders of the FARC in the context of this case. But we have also more than 3,000 of victims participate, participating in this proceeding. Uh, related to kidnappings. We identified three policies to analyze more than two, uh, 20,000 of kidnappings. The policy of uh, financi financial gain for the FARC. Second, the forcing humanitarian exchanges for the FARC. And three, preserving territorial control, punishing and intimidating using the kidnappings against the civil population in several zones of Colombia. And uh, another example of macro case is macro case number three on false positives. It is like a extrajudicial killings in Colombia. And we have dealt in this case with war crimes and uh, crimes against humanity. The crimes against humanity of murder and enforced disappearance. In a specific period of time between 22 uh, 2002 and 2008, six years of uh, these extrajudicial killings, and we are prosecuting more than 6,000 of extrajudicial killings, and around 3,000 members of the army involved in, mo in this most uh, of in this of uh, in these 6,000 extrajudicial killings. Previously, the ordinary proceedings. Uh, uh, organize uh, some kind of justice for these more than 6,000 of extrajudicial killings, but with a special fo focus in the low ranks of the chain of command. But in this context, we received more than 50 reports from the victims. We have more than 2,000 of victims recognized it, uh, in order to participate in the proceedings. More than 700 voluntary statements uh, like uh, this are uh, some kind of cross-examination of military personnel during these five years. Six public hearings with the uh, observation of the victims to these kind of uh, uh, interrogatories, uh, cross-examinations. And we began from bottom to top, and we began the uh, cross-examination of uh, more than 20 generals involved in this case. And uh, I would like to highlight uh, uh, the, the, the four uh, first indictments in this uh, particular macro case. We began with an analysis of uh, a specific policy behind these uh, uh, 6,000 extrajudicial killings, a policy of um, it's kind of a policy where in which the body of the enemy killed in action were, was the main indicator of the success in the, of the military effort in that period of time, in that period of the armed conflict. There is no uh, importance of another res results different to the killing of the enemy. And because of that, dozens of farmers, traders, informal transporters, Vulnerable people were part of the false positive killings with the necessity to present results in, 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 in uh, every, every form possible. 
Many of the victims were reported as unidentified persons. Some crimes were committed by armed forces and paramilitary groups. And sometimes they used uh, public resources to simulate false successes in the armed conflict. And also, in this context, uh, in the macro case, we, so we put a special attention to serious, differentiated, and disproportionate damages against groups of special protection, like indigenous peoples in several parts of the country. And uh, considering the time, I would like to highlight uh, another three macro cases. We have 11, but I only put attention in three of the macro cases. This is a case uh, related to recruitment and use of girls and boys in the armed conflict. I, I would like to highlight the, that we have uh, in, into attention more than 20 years of recruitment of children in the context of the armed conflict, with uh, some prioritization in this kind of crimes, sexual violence and uh, um, enforced disappearances, and homicide, torture, and inhuman, cruel, and degrading treatments to children inside the, uh, the guerrilla of the farm. And in this fa finally five minutes, I only put attention in the restorative dimension of our work in the context of the macro cases. What, what we are doing to transform the previous intervention of the ordinary proceedings. In this dialogue, di dialogic procedure, first we open a floor for the victims to present their voice behind, uh, before the special jurisdiction. Yeah, sorry. Um, gathering reports from institutions and civil society, we received more than 900 of reports around the whole country. Uh, uh, and the, our objective is to make visible their voices about the facts, the patterns of violence, and the heart. And this is a voice that we recognize that previously they, do, they didn't have a voice before the ordinary proceedings. And because of that, it was a, our starting point. Second, we recognize the legal status as victims of those who accomplish all the requirements established by law. But also, for example, for instance, we recognize territories as a victims, for instance, in several macro cases that we are working in now or the participation of some collective groups of victims in the context of the uh, proceedings. Third, we use this voice from the victims to put before the perpetrators in order to ask them what they are thinking about the voice of the, victim, of the victims. We summon the perpetrators in order to present voluntary statements regarding the reports and in that context, we ask, um, we change the kind of cross-examination in the ordinary proceedings in order to understand why a person is involved in political violence. Why uh, um, a military personnel, after 10 years of work within the army, transform the, the, their path in a path of a, 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 a in the participation of killings or other crimes in the context of the macro case that I mentioned before. When was the first time that these, in, this, these perpetrators involved in this kind of uh, politic violence? And four, uh, we receive the victims' perspectives, the victims' observations on these uh, uh, voluntary statements from the perpetrators. We ask to the victims uh, about what was adequate in that uh, ex uh, cross-examination, what was re-victimization, what is pending in the context of the declarations. And five, uh, after this dialogue between, with the victims and with the perpetrators, we organize uh, indictments, considering the voice of the victims, considering the proof, but considering the collective harms and other kind of harms uh, presented in the case. We have an example, for instance, in one indictment, 
the damage to memory and good name, the damage, the damage to the cultural integrity of indigenous peoples, the damage to the health of family members, the loss of harmony of communities and indigenous peoples, and another kind of damages. And we put this in an indictment, organizing also the patterns and policies behind crimes against humanity in the context of this analysis of macrocriminality. And sixth, uh, we organize a public hearing between the victims and perpetrators. The picture that I uh, uh, use at the beginning of my presentation is the, the public hearing of announcement of responsibility for the fact. And this is a picture of the acknowledgement of responsibility of military personnel front to front before their victims in, a, in the first public acknowledgement uh, in the context of extrajudicial killings. We can see here uh, the first general recognizing their responsibility about these kind of policies behind these more than 6,000 of executions. And we organized these public hearings and we explained that the voice of the victim was the path to acknowledgement of responsibility in the context of this uh, restorative procedure. And after that, uh, in the, we have, the, we put, we organized these encounters uh, after a separate work with victims and perpetrators, and in this context of encounter, uh, we overcome asymmetries between victims and perpetrators. And finally, uh, we submit a decision to the Tribunal for Peace with proposals of restorative sanctions. This is important because the kind of sanctions in the context of the special jurisdiction include the possibility of restorative sanctions uh, to crimes against humanity, to, cra to war crimes, we are talking about no prison in this kind of international crimes. In the context of fully committed, um, when a perpetrator is fully committed to the whole truth and integral remedies for the victims. And we have alternative sanctions or ordinary sanctions in the context of non acknowledgement of responsibility. In that cases, we, the perpetrator can, uh, um, can be uh, subject to until 20 years in prison in this context of non acknowledgement of responsibility. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to finish my presentation saying that the major trends, the major challenges uh, for the future are how to achieve uh, this kind of massive victim participation in the macro cases. How to manage legitimate, legitimate representation of victims in this kind of macro cases. How to present collective decision making in a military outfit, outfit, for instance. To assign individual criminal responsibility in this context of collective violence. What are the human rights standards in terms of due process and victim participation in transitional justice. It's the same participation we, when we are dealing with one individual case and what is the, the change when we are dealing with more than 6,000 of extrajudicial killings. How to learn from indigenous justice and collaborate with traditional authorities. And finally, finally how can punishment how can we use restorative justice to punish these kind of, of crimes and use the restorative justice to be part of reincorporation into society? This is a starting point of, for our discussion and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Justin Palavaras. Uh, confirms actually my impression this is an extraordinarily uh, complex but also uh, you know creative and transformative uh, process so we look forward to I'm sure to asking you uh, questions uh, next so we'll have all the presentations first obviously Justice Alexandra Sandoval Mantilla uh, will be speaking on the gender uh, justice dimension of the transitional uh, justice effort in Colombia thank you
um, this on? Yeah. yeah. So good afternoon for everyone. I just want to start thanking uh, the McGill Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. Sorry, that's a difficult word for me. <laughs> even in Spanish, um, <laughs> to pronounce it. And uh, well, thank you for the invitation. This is, for us, it's an honor to be here and to tell you and to show you the work we have been doing for the past five years in our country. Uh, so um, the judge, Oscar, uh, presented the generality of what we do, uh, but I'm going to focus on the gender approach and how, uh, this is being work and the innovative part of what we are doing. So um, he did a good introduction about the armed conflict in Colombia. Uh, what I want to highlight is that we have almost 10 million persons that are in our country. It, we are around 55 million persons in Colombia. So that's a huge number to think about it. If you realize it, uh, I once thought that that means that every family in Colombia has a victim, at least. And if you see of those 10 million persons that are victims in Colombia, 52% of them are women, women and girls. And that means that we have a huge problem and that uh, in order to deal with the past, and uh, lastly, also with the present, we have to take into account what had, had, had happened to these women and girls. So uh, we are really proud, and every time we present the peace agreement in Colombia, we say that, uh, and it's true, that it is, this is the first agreement, peace agreement in the world that includes a gender perspective. And since it's the first one, uh, you will think it was easy to, to introduce the gender perspective in the peace agreement, but it was not. And this is because when the peace negotiations started, we did the negotiations in Havana and Cuba, none of the persons that were participating in the negotiation were women. And that has something to do with it. When there are not representation or enough representation of women, where no one was thinking about it. Uh, but thankfully, in Colombia, we had a strong uh, women's organization. And they start uh, making pressure to the persons that were there in the Havana saying, well, what I told, just told you. If 52% of the victims are women, something has to be done in this peace agreement. So, on the half of the way, they accepted to create this gender subcommission to start inter integrating uh, the language, but also the perspective in the agreement. And at that point, they had negotiated at least half of the agreement. And what we have to do, because at that time I used to, I worked in an NGO that tried to uh, introduce the gender perspective in the agreement, uh, what we started was to show, to look at what they had already agreed and to try to think what we could do to uh, repair those women that were victims. But not only the victims, how can we change the country uh, to make it a more inclusive country? So at the end, what the peace agreement says is that the gender approach is a principle that has to be implemented in all the uh, rules and proceedings that were created in the agreement, but also it established at least, it depends on uh, who counts it. I always say it's 121, but someone says it's 100, others say they're 130, specific measures to ensure the rights of women and girls in the agreement. And to give you some examples, for example, in what we do in the special jurisdiction for peace, uh, there were some rules established that were really important. For example, that sexual violence 
is not possible to grant amnesties in this type of crimes. And this was really important. It seems easy to say it, but it was the first time that it was done. Also, that we needed a special group uh, for investigating these types of, of crimes. That it was not enough to have a prostitution office, but th that we needed some experts to do this kind of work. And the other one, that I'm really proud of it, because I'm uh, uh, proof of that, is that it established that uh, the entities, the tribunal, the uh, uh, truth commission, and all the bodies that were created in the uh, peace agreement had to have a representation of women. And I'm glad to tell you that we are 32 judges, and 53% of them we are women. And of, the, of those 38, also eight of them are part of uh, ethnic groups in Colombia. Four of them are indigenous and four of them are, are of Colombia. And this is really good for our, our country because we have a history of discrimination. And this was done because it was established in the agreement, but I wanted to tell you that this was also a, a win of the Colombian women's organization. So, when the uh, special jurisdiction for peace started, we had this mandate to uh, implement not only the gender perspective, but also the ethnic perspective and the territorial, territorial and environmental uh, perspective. And why, it, why we do that, this, or why the peace agreement has this mandate? Because if you see a Colombian map, and you look where the ethnic communities live, and then you then look where the war was worse, and then you look, it was not in the cities, it was not in the main cities. You can see that if you don't take into account the approaches, you are not going to respond properly to the victims. So uh, when we started, we created these permanent commissions, uh, the judge, Siomar is going to talk about you, about the ethnic commission, but I'm going to focus myself on the gender commission. So uh, what we do in the gender commission, well, basically we try to promote and to effectively implement the gender perspective in all of the proceedings that are made in the uh, special jurisdiction for peace. Uh, we are six, six judges part that are part of the commission, but also uh, every department of the special jurisdiction. You saw the, the picture of all the chambers and everything that we have that is really complex. Uh, they have a representation there. And uh, we started working, and of course the first question was how we define the gender approach or the gender perspective in the special jurisdiction for peace. Because sometimes we talk about it, but we don't really know what we are talking. So, well, first, we see it as a methodology to acknowledge and transform inequality between genders. We know that this is bigger and it's more important and it's not only to be applied in transitional justice. And so we know it's a methodology that can be used not only in times of war, but also in times of peace. Another point that we decided since the beginning, and this was really difficult in a point in Colombia to say it, is that when we're talking about the gender approach, we're also talking about the LGBTY community. And why it was difficult? Because when uh, the negotiation of the agreement was made in our country, one of the main topics that uh, was discussed was the uh, recognition of this uh, community as victims, and also a recognition of them as persons that were uh, victims in the conflict and that we had to ensure their rights uh, also in the procedures. So uh, the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, since the beginning, accepted that uh, we were working not only with girls and women victims, but also with the LGBT community, and this was also something new to do. I told you, this is the first, first time a peace agreement 
that has a gender approach and also is the first time a tribunal is trying to collect information and to show how this community was damaged and the harm they had during the conflict. The third point uh, that we took into account when we defined the gender perspective is that the armed conflict is not the main cause of the gender violence uh, that women, girls, and the LGBTQI community suffer. These people suffer violence and discrimination in times of peace. What the conflict does is that it makes, makes it worse. Uh, but even in, if we say sometime, someday in Colombia we don't have an armed conflict, these people are still going to suffer this kind of violence. So if we want to change something, we don't have only to focus on the conflict, but on the main causes that uh, are caused that cause this kind of violence. Uh, and the fourth uh, point that was really important for us is that to take into account that the uh, harm that suffer women and girls and the LGBTY community during the conflict was disproportionate, sorry, and uh, different than the others suffered. And by that recognition, it's really important not only to ad acknowledge the truth, but also to uh, think about the reparations they are going to get. And also uh, to think about the proceedings and uh, the things we have to think into account in the hearings, uh, in the reports, in order to guarantee them their, their right to justice. So uh, what does the Gender Commission do in practice. We have a special function uh, that is not really common for people that work in uh, judiciary systems, is that we can make concepts for our colleagues. For example, if one of our colleagues has a case that involves the gender perspective, they don't have to be experts, but they can call the commission and tell them about the case and we will make a concept saying to them how they can respond, how can they protect the rights of the victims, or how can they m try to do the things in order to implement the gender uh, perspective. This is not really common because sometimes, well, most of the times, uh, the judges, well, they have uh, autonomy. So someone that is telling them how they should do the things is not really common. We do the concepts concepts that are not mandatory, but we, what we have seen in practice is that the judges use them in the cases. At this point, we have more than 40 concepts uh, from different topics. The relation between sexual violence and the armed conflict, that is some, one topic that it has been discussed a lot in our country. How to prove that one, spe one specific sexual violence crime was committed in the armed conflict or relating to the armed conflict. So we gave them, gave them the tools to make the analyze. Uh, sometimes we don't make the analyze, but at least we, we gave them the information that will uh, make them take the best decision as a judge. The other function that we have as the Gender Commission is that uh, we promote the participation of girls and women in the proceedings. And these, uh, also is uh, not as common, but this is a special uh, jurisdiction, this is transitional justice, is that we work with the women's and LGBTQI community movement. And we go to them to not only to explain what we do, but also to uh, coordinate and articulate how they are going to participate in the proceedings. And finally, we uh, do all the cooperation with the other institutions of the state, because a lot of institutions are, are involved, and uh, we try to promote uh, the gender perspective in all of them. So um, we have, uh, have, have had some progress, really important progress for me. For example, the rules of proceedings that uh, we have in the special jurisdiction for peace also have special articles 
that implement the gender approach. To give you an example, we have an article that says that not, not, not a woman, not a person that have suffered sexual violence, ha it's obligated to be confronted with the perpetrator if she or he doesn't want it. Also, I, I will say this is easy, but this is really innovative for a rules of procedure. Uh, and this, is what, this was one of the main discussions that we had at the beginning of the special jurisdiction. This is one of the examples of the many articles and rules with gender perspective that we introduced to the, these rules of proceedings. We also have the concepts that I talked about it before, more than 40 concepts uh, that have been done for the uh, jurisdiction. And uh, also, we have guaranteed the participation of, we, of the women's movement, as I was telling you, but in one really important point. The way the victims participated or started participated in the special jurisdiction, as Judge Oscar explained before, was uh, with the presentation of some reports. But these were not like the usual uh, petition that you will uh, present before a tribunal. They had, this has to be collective. It was not only one victim. So you have to organize the group of victims so they will present the reports of the cases because they were in the same territory or in the same time lab or uh, they had suffered something similar. And what we did at the beginning of the special jurisdiction of, uh, for peace, what the, the Commission of Gender did was to approach uh, these women and to teach them how to do their reports. We, did, we couldn't do the reports because after that we were going the ones to re receive those reports. We were the judges but at least explain to them how they could do it in a simple manner. So with this way, we can encourage them to participate. And uh, I will show you after we had a really good response from the women's and LGBTY uh, community in this matter. But also we have a several challenge. See, since I don't have so much time, I'm going to refer to only two of them and it's uh, the case of sexual violence and uh, the topic of intersectionality. But also, uh, all of the topics with the LGBTY community is one of our challenges because, since, as I was telling you before, this is the first time that a tribunal is doing this. So, for example, we don't have as much uh, legal definitions for much of uh, what had happened to them. So we have to create and define and trying to understand uh, to give them a good legal response. And also on, on the matter of restorative justice, the question is how to repair uh, women that have suffered gender-based violence or sexual violence when this is a transitional justice system that uh, it's at least not going to send to jail most, most of the perpetrators but that these perpetrators have to acknowledge the truth and to reparate the victims. And the question is, how do you repair sexual violence? And it's a main question, but I'm not going to focus on that. Um, so, about the sexual violence in the uh, peace agreement. As I was telling you, a lot of what was established in the peace agreement, uh, it's new, it seems easy, but it's new, uh, and the first this is the first agreement that uh, established establish sexual violence as a specific crime. And it did it to say, as I was telling you, that it's not possible to grant amnesties for this kind of violence. But also, uh, the agreement established that women and girls were the ones that, that were more affected uh, for this kind, type of crime. So, this is important because it gave a mandate to the special jurisdiction about uh, dealing with this type of crimes. And this uh, takes you to a debate that is currently occurring in our country and is the necessity to open a macro case about uh, gender-based violence, including sexual violence. Uh, 
This is, has been a demand of the Colombian women organizations and of the LGBT community organizations since the beginning of the uh, special jurisdiction for peace. It also has been a demand of the international community because it's, it's an opportunity. This will be the first time that an, inter an international internal tribunal that is trying to investigate and sanction uh, war crimes, uh, it's going to see specifically these crimes individually, but not as only as a type of crimes that occur with other types of crimes during an arm armed conflict. Uh, what is happening right now in the special jurisdiction? Judge Oscar told you that we have 10 other cases. In all of these cases, they are trying to investigate also gender-based violence. And this is important, and this is, was important since the beginning for the Gender Commission, because we told them since the beginning that it was important to acknowledge that in all of these crimes, kidnapping, recruitment, extrajudicial killings, there were also women. And that we have to see how they had suffered this differently than the men. For example, for women that were kidnapped by FARC during years, what had happened to them, not only that they were possibly uh, in danger of being uh, sexual abuse or to be in that kind of situation, but they described some, time, some type of uh, situations that had to be taken into account. For example, they described how during the kidnapping, every time they had to take a bath, they were surrounded by men that were, of course, uh, taking care of them, taking care, guarding them, and they had to be naked in front of these men. This could be totally different, the experience can be totally different for a woman than for a man. And to acknowledge that, it's really important. So what we said in the commission since the beginning is that every macro case has to have the lenses of their gender approach. But this is not enough. As I was telling you, the Colombian Women's Organization and the women and the persons from the LGBTQI community that were victims of sexual violence want to have a specific case. And this, because this is also, this has also a symbolic meaning. This is to tell our country that they, during the war they not only men killed or people kidnapped, but that this happened all over the country and that the number of victims is really, really high. I was telling you that uh, one of the progress that we are proud in the uh, Gender Commission is uh, the reports that we received from the victims. And I, wa I wanted to tell you the numbers so you can imagine how uh, difficult the situation is. So from 1977 victims reports presented before the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, we have identified at least 2,047 facts related to gender-based vi violence, including sexual violence committed by FARC EPE, by the guerrilla group, and 1,103 facts committed by the army in our country. So it is true, and we have it in numbers, that this happened, that it happened all over the country, and that it's necessary to investigate and to sanction those that committed this type of crimes. So, because of this, uh, the Chamber of Acknowledgement uh, or Recognition uh, right now is in a phase that is prior to the prioritization of the case, is taking into account the reports that the victims presented, but also that the, the information that we had before uh, from the state, and uh, we think or we hope that they, op they will open the case soon. Uh, so that we can start having what you saw in those uh, pictures, those type of hearings, but in cases of sexual violence. About the topic of intersectionality, 
This is really also interesting. Uh, remember that I told you at the beginning that most of the uh, conflict uh, occurred in territories where ethnic groups lived in Colombia. So this means also that a lot of the victims are not only women, but also are women that are indigenous women or Afro-Colombian women. So this meant that we have to use this concept of intersectionality that comes, uh, it's actually a response to the white feminism. And it's a response uh, to acknowledge that most of us, most of all women are not only women. We're all a lot of things. I'm, I'm a judge, I'm Colombian, uh, and I'm a woman. And uh, Xiomara could say it, she's also an Afro-Colombian woman. And that makes a difference when you have all of these uh, coexistence factors in your, your life. And sometimes those coexistence factors uh, can be based for violence and discrimination. What is really interesting, what happened in Colombia, is that we took that concept of intersectionality that was created also in the north part of the world. It, it's, and we made our own concept. And it was included in the peace agreement. And it's called, and this is a little translation uh, from Spanish, is the women and family and generation approach. In the ethnic chapter that Xiomara is going to explain in a, a wider manner before, uh, after my presentation, uh, the indigenous and the Afro-Colombian women said, okay, it's important to, to have the gender approach, but you have to take into account that that approach has a, to be different for us. Because if you don't make it different, you are not accepting that we have different factors of discrimination and violence. And I wanted to give you, the, I gave you the numbers of victims in Colombia. I wanted to show you how bad it was for the ethnic groups in Colombia. The, of the 10 million, uh, almost 10 million victims in Colombia, 10% of them are Afro-Colombians. And 5% of them are indigenous people. And this is really big because 14% of our population is Afro-Colombian and 4% of our population is indigenous. So this almost shows that most of them were victims in the conflict. And then when we th think that half of them are women, then you see how disproportionate this was in the conflict. So uh, what we have done to implement this women and family and generation approach. First, we started talking to the women, to the Afro-Colombian and to the indigenous women. We thought that that was the uh, main, the most important thing to do in order to understand the approach. The approach, this kind of approach, tell us that uh, if we don't hear the, their voice, we're not going to understand why they're talking about not only women, but also about family and generation. And this has to do with a lot of the way they think. For example, indigenous women, and I heard it when uh, you did the presentation, uh, have in Colombia have the same idea of their relation with the territory. So when they were victimized, they were not only the victims, the community was also a victim, but also the territory. And to take that into account in our proceedings is necessary in order to guarantee this intersectionality or the women, family, or generation approach that was established in the peace agreement. So uh, what we did, we did a lot of proceedings. We established a way to communicate to them and to relate to them in order to make them participate in the proceedings in the jurisdiction. And also we have, a, had, have had a, some concepts that we had worked together with the ethnic commission, not, not only from the gender perspective, but also with the ethnic commission in special cases. A, it, and I'm going to finish with this. One of the concepts 
uh, that was really interesting was about a girl from an indigenous group in Colombia that is called Waju that was victim of sexual violence by FARC. And we had to know how to communicate the decisions that we were taking to this girl. For me, as a feminist, the answer was contact her because we have to, uh, to establish, uh, yeah, to establish or at least to uh, guarantee that she participates in the process. That was my first uh, approach as a feminist. But then the community and the women of the community explained to us that if we did that, we will re-victimize her. Because in her community, what you have to do first is to approach the authorities of the community. And this community in particular has one person that is in charge to receive all the news of the community. So we have to first talk to this person and then talk to the girl. Because I was not going to accept that we didn't talk to the girl. We had to do both. Uh, but they teach us how to do it. And this, what, and, and this was what actually we did in the special jurisdiction. But it shows to you that uh, when you're, we were talking on, about gender approach and especially the ethnic approach, what is most important to do is to talk with the victims first. They are the ones, they, they are the ones that are going to guide you how to do the proceedings and to not re-victimize them in this type of justice that it's uh, really difficult to manage because we are talking about really several crimes and it's really important that we do the, thing, the, the proceedings in a way that really respond to the demand of justice that women, girls, and the LGBTY community has in this piece of movement. So I will finish with this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Okay. I want to start saying thank you uh, um, for this invitation and thanks for all of you for being here. Um, I think that Alexandra and Oscar said everything, but I'm trying to be uh, to say something about the, the ethnically and racially different approach in the special jurisdiction for this. Um, as you know, and Oscar said, more than five decades of non-international armed conflict. But Alexandra said something that is important to remind um, the conflict in Colombia is continuing. So we start. We we are trying to fit with that, but um, and we are trying to make another uh, peace agreement in this moment with another group that uh, um, LN, and we are trying. Um, to resolve the problems, but the ethnic communities are uh, still suffering the conflict. Mm, the construction of an stable and lasting peace in Colombia is only possible with the presence uh, and the participation of the ethnic peoples, who account of the diversity and the multiculturalism of the country. Therefore, for the special jurisdiction for peace, to achieve the highest justice and accountability for violations of human rights and the infraction of the international criminal law that occurred 
through the conflict is most respect in principle, like the self-determination, autonomy, uh, and the self-government participation, consultation, and prior free and informed consent of ethnic peoples, among others. As a jurisdiction, we are mindful of the great historical work we are carrying out. We know that to advance in the construction of peace and achieve the real reconciliation in the country is necessary to a correct administration of justice where practices implemented by ethnic communities of the legal system. We know our, we need to coordinate and articulate through the intercultural dialogue. In a, I want to make a, a contextualization of the ethnic chapter in the framework of the final peace agreement signed by the Colombian national government and the guerrillas of the FARC-EP, the Revolutionary Armed, Force, uh, Armed Forces of Colombia. The armed, the armed conflict has, like Alexandra says, and, and we know, is, was disproportionately affects the rights of the ethnic communities and they have genuine and legitimate interest in participating in the different mechanisms of transitional justice create to satisfy the rights of the victims. For that reason, the construction of the peace agreement without the presence of the ethnic communities was not something possible. But I think that was the same like the women's, but the difference that, uh, I think that, that the, the gender approaching was like in the whole of the peace agreement. But I have to say that, that the ethnic communities, we arrive at the last of the peace agreement. Uh, I think that, that, that we have to say that because that's true. And, and, and however, we have to, to take into account that the ethnic chapter was possible because all the ethnic people also and, uh, and the ethnic authorities and the ethnic organizations uh, was uh, trying to say what happened here in this peace agreement with the ethnic communities. We need to be here and we need to be, uh, to have proceedings and we have to have all different because the conflict was affected in this proportionality forms. So, however, after five years of negotiation in Havana, Cuba, the resistance and the resilience of the ethnic communities opened the door to them to create and include the ethnic chapter. Uh, due to the ethnic communities and the authorities create the Ethnic Racial Commission for Peace and Defend the Territorial Rights, who proposed is to safe world the territorial and collective right the ethnic population in the process of negotiation uh, and implementing the peace agreement. The ethnic chapter begins with the recognition of the national government and the guerrillas and the, and the guerrillas of the FARC-EP that the ethnic community have contributed to the construction of the stable and lasting peace as well as the economic and social development of the country. In addition of that, the Charter states how as the result of decolonialism and enslavement and structural racism and ethnic communities have faced discrimination for displacement among other crimes. The Ethnic Charter also underscores how the international armed, uh, the international armed conflict has seriously impacted the ethnic communities and how particular measures need to be implemented to guarantee his community rights. To continue with this intervention, I want to, I, I want to show yes. uh, how in Colombia, even we, are, we have a multicultural country, and we have in the Constitution, uh, the indigenous jurisdiction has a recondition uh, in a, in a, as a part of the judicial uh, process and the judicial system. Such as the Afro-Colombian uh, justice emerged because the consolidation, I think, of the, our constitution and the international uh, human mm, rights law and the rule of law, which has been the product of the different struggles for the uh, reivindication and the rights of ethnic communities in general, 
so we have the possibility to uh, have uh, authorities like indigenous people, but we have also Afro-Colombian people, and we also have the opportunity to talk with the room. We have room communities. I think we recognize like gypsy communities, but we also have those communities in Colombia. So the implementation of the initially and racially approach within the special jurisdiction for peace have the necessity to create a commission, like a gender commission, so we have ethnic racial commission, since the inception has been an institution aware of the historical work that is carried out in the construction of peace. To this extent, it has been respectful in imparting a correct administration of justice within the framework of the final peace agreement, and in a different national international standards with necessarily implies the incorporation of the ethnic charter discussion in the world of the special jurisdiction for peace. This has been a possible do with, un we have to understanding of the right of the self-determination of autonomy with includes duty, the duty to recognize and respect traditional authorities, but also the implementation of prior consultation to understand the ethnical and racial approach in restorative justice. So, in this five year of the implementation of the Special Jurisdiction for Peace has fully, uh, is uh, to fulfill this mandate by gathering information, conducting hearings, making judicial decisions, and accredit victims. So, in 2021, I think, yes, um, we published a protocol with relationship with, with, with the, between the Special Jurisdiction of Peace and black Afro-Colombian and racial and palenquero communities. The protocol, for example, specifies how the special jurisdiction for peace has to need to coordinate and dialogue with the authorities from communities, council, and other organizations for to guarantee the full participation of the victim. We also have the same, not, not the same, but we also have a protocol with the indigenous people, and we also have a protocol with uh, room communities or gypsy communities. Uh, that in order to guarantee, guarantee, guarantee the, the participation of the ethnic people at the special jurisdiction of this. This, uh, this commission um, that in that moment I'm coordinating, uh, the ethnic commission is a permanently um, um, institution that has just belonging the ethnic communities also, we have the director, for example, of the investigation of unprosecuted unit, we call uh, Unidad de Investigación y Acusación. Uh, we have also um, the executive secretary in the permanent, in the, in, the, in the commission. We also have the president of the uh, special jurisdiction of peace in this commission. And we have two judges that are not ethnic, that also belong to the, to the commission. We have another, a lot of functions, but um, I think we are in shape for the principal uh, functions that are, for example, um, we promote the adequate incorporation of the ethnically and racially differentiated approach and the effectiveness of the interjurisdictional coordination between the special jurisdiction office and the different ethnic justice systems. We also formulate and define and uh, issue guideline concepts and programs to lean the effective incorporation of the ethnic approach as a transversal component to the implementation and the operation of the all, of the all procedures in the special jurisdiction for peace. We also do recommendations that guide the exercise of the chambers and the sections on the cases or on the micro cases uh, related to ethnic communities. We support the formulation and application to the ethnically and differently approach which made it possible to determine condition and vulnerability of their, um, and their differential impact on their peoples among. Now I will take a few minutes to talk about the macro case zero night. Um, yes. That's crimes against ethnic communities and their territories. Why I want to talk about? Because I think it's the first time that someone will be investigated for the crimes against ethnic communities in Colombia about the armed conflict. 
Uh, I think that's really important for us um, uh, because the systematic and different harm suffered by ethnic communities in the context of the non-international armed conflict. Um, I think because the communities and the ethnic authorities has a legal subject, subject of rights. The ethnic communities and their interdependent relationship with the territory has a legal subject. I think in this micro case, we, have, we are trying uh, to investigate what happened with the ethnic communities, but also we try to investigate what happened with the territories for these communities. This last aspect is fundamental with, uh, with, within the micro case due to the weight of understanding the territory of ethnic communities that are safe, but for them, because we need to understand that for them the territory is seen as a source of life, existing and identified. It's understood as a living subject uh, with, the, with which there is an ancestral relationship. Therefore, when the armed conflict began to affect their ethnic territories, ethnic communities felt that mere existence or future generation was a risk. Also, the criminal macro case on the world impact on the ethnic communities is of a national scale. But the special jurisdiction of peace and the uh, chamber of the recognition of the truth of truth have, we, have, we have a methodology that we call like illustrative territories. Because we, now, we need to know that we are a temporally a uh, special jurisdiction for pieces. We have uh, 10 years, I think 10 years more, no, no more than. So we are, we are going to be a concentration in an illustrative territory. So we are going to investigate what happened with communities that are located in Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta and Surriende Aires, communities like are located in the Pacific area, that Buenaventura, Dagua, Timbiquí, López de Micay, and Guap is, is a specific territory. Amazonia, you know, Amazonia is, is a, I think, the biggest one. Uh, Orinoquia, and what happened in Chocó, where it's from Yuri. Uh, why this, why we are trying to locate it in these communities? Because the disproportionality and conflict suffered the ethnic communities in these territories. So, um, and, 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 and we, we need to know that we received like more than five, four, 400 percent, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 545 percent of reports uh, presented by ethnic and human rights organization that they identified uh, how the conflict affect the community of the people that are living in those, in those territories. Also, we are going to investigate crimes, but we are trying to identify, for example, homicides, massacres, for displacements, for disappearance, attacks against civilians, cultural property and places of, of worship, destruction of the territory in the inescapable relationship with the existence of the ethnic communities, and other behaviors associated with the pattern of the cases. And those crimes are the ones we are going, I think that we are going to, to try to investigate um, in this macro case. Um, okay, now I have like a final thought uh, that I want to present. I think that the implementation of the ethnic racial approach in the special jurisdiction for PIT is today an undeniable reality. In this regard, I think the notion of the preferential and the prevailing jurisdiction of the, of, of the special jurisdiction for peace serve as a safe word of to guarantee its prerogative and a justice component of the system, which has the demanding task of imparting justice with respect to the conduct communities in the framework of the armed conflicts between the FARC, EP, and the Colombian states. Always basis and of the respect for the ethnic people. In an armed conflict as complex as the Colombian one, within the framework in which violation of human rights and, in, and international humanitarian law were communities. I think the necessity of collaboration between different jurisdictions is understandable 
and its a necessity of the special jurisdiction for peace. In that order, the transitional justice and peaceful coexistence are achieved as the goals of this state. The interjurisdictional collaboration between the special jurisdiction for peace and the ethnic justice require a joint effort and continuous intercultural and institutional dialogue that allows guarantee the effective participation of the victim of the different ethnic communities. In this regard, what is essential is that both the special jurisdiction for peace and the ethnic justice need to continue to act jointly in search of the most appropriate inter interaction procedures in order to respond to demand of the current transitional process. The special jurisdiction for peace has multiple challenges. I think in the implementation of the uh, ethnic and racial approach, we are doing a lot, but we know that we need to do more. However, as a judge, we will not give up on the search for justice and peace for the ethnic peoples in Colombia. We will continue advising uh, with a firm step, even they uh, treating us, trying to hinder our work. As a, I think ethnic peoples in Colombia have suffered greatly uh, from the armed conflict and the structural racism. The ethnic peoples demand truth, demand justice, reparation, and I think as a judge, we cannot be inferior to our mandate. Finally, it should be noted that putting the rights of the victim of the center of a peace negotiation, I think, is, is an over, but it's a challenge too. Moreover, the implementation of, the, of an ethnically differentiated approach is a guiding principle to guarantee victims' rights and the taking into consideration of, of the race, the ethnicity, the cultural difference, and worldwide is a unique feature of the Colombian transitional justice process. Both of these approaches can set an important precedent, a precedent for the participation of the ethnic people in a future process of the transitional justice. Consequently, this model of transitional justice can be a source of inspiration, I think, for other similar profit process in Colombia and other transitional justice around the world. Thank you. Yeah, on, on these uh, concluding words, I mean, I'm reminded that, you know, one striking aspect of transitional justice is how every new wave has tended to learn from the previous ones. And so I think the paradigm keeps getting better, but, but of course, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of challenges. I mean, a few years ago with South Africa and, and uh, you know, there's been lots of discussion in, in uh, Bosnia as well, and uh, I think now Colombia. All right, well, I, I think we have about uh, 20, 25 minutes left, and uh, uh, I'm sure many of you are eager to ask questions. We have two microphones uh, on each side, so I think the best thing is if you go um, to the microphones, that's how we do it traditionally, to make sure that everyone does uh, hear your questions. So please, go ahead, and if you can just introduce uh, yourself, um, go ahead. Hello there, my name is Tara. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming to speak to us at the law faculty today. I know we all really appreciate it. Um, my question is in reference to the macro case number seven that was discussed about the recruitment of children into the fighting forces. I was wondering if there's any mechanism being developed in the court to deal with fighters who were coerced potentially as children into participating in some of these crimes. Maybe we'll take a, a, another, just a couple of more questions. Uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry, sorry, there you. Uh, thank you, and thank you uh, for your presentation. Um, I am Colombian and I'm feeling, I'm feeling very proud that all the achievements that you have say that is really uh, lovable to hear your accent here because I'm full of accents from different parts of the world, so it's, it's good to feel at home. 
<laughs> so my question is, uh, you mentioned that uh, there has been in the process different perspectives, like the ethnic perspective, gender perspective, but uh, also uh, unions are workers, uh, are parts in, of the, not directly related to the conflict, but are, are, are key uh, subjects of, or, or they, they, they play a role really interesting in the, in the community in, in now that we are building a, a new social dialogue. So my question will be, now that there is a new uh, uh, process or a, a, a new negotiation with the uh, ELN group, uh, do you think that in this case would be something different to, uh, to, to try to involve unions or, or associations of employers in the, in the negotiations? I, I know that's not your, your field, but, but perhaps we can have some insights uh, from that uh, perspective. Thank you so much. And maybe we'll take a third question to get us started. Thank you again uh, for coming. It was a really wonderful talk. Um, I had a question related to apologies and, and the amnesty procedure. Uh, I think one of the difficulties many transitional justice procedures run into is evaluating sincerity because it's kind of a very internal sort of affair. I was wondering how you conceived of that challenge and, in a sense, how you respond to it. Wait, why don't we start with these three questions and then we'll take uh, a second round. Mm -hmm. Who wants to start? Oh, thank you very much for these questions. Um, I would like to begin with the with some information about macro case number uh, seven, about recruitment of children. Um, first, uh, this is a very complex case because a lot of victims of recruitment in Colombia are, um, are people who in the past were part of the FARC but they, uh, they get to get rid of the FARC or escape from the guerrilla, and they are um, anonymously in their towns with a lot of people that they didn't know, they don't know that they were part of the FARC. And because of that, for a victim to say, I was a member of the FARC, uh, recruited uh, with uh, any consent or with any uh, with a lot of coercion to do that is very difficult, and because of that, uh, the the first the, the one of the most difficult part of the work is to construct trust with the victims, and the, this construction of trust uh, is uh, is is a little bit long path. We have to work in a lot of parts of the country uh, to open several scenarios for victims to come anonymously. A lot of people are with a lot of fear with the previous captors, uh, with the previous uh, commanders at, uh, at the FARC. But we, are, um, we have a lot of, uh, of um, several steps in, uh, in the context of the proceedings that we are working with them. And uh, I would like to highlight the victims of sexual violence in the context of recruitment. It, uh, we have taken into account uh, even uh, reproductive violence with the use of forced uh, uh, abortion and uh, con uh, forced contraception in the, uh, with a lot of girls and young women inside the FARC. And um, we have received a lot of reports, and a lot of them is, uh, are, are uh, um, 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 uh, with no publici publicity, is, um, uh, with, um, is, is a material, internal material for the special jurisdiction. We began uh, hearings about the um, the cross-examination, the, the voluntary statements from the perpetrators, we have uh, had uh, more than around 50 or 60 uh, voluntary statements from the FARC, from the guerrilla of the FARC, 
a lot of people inside the FARC, from the FARC, denies, uh, or in the context of this cross-examination, denies uh, some part of the patterns. We are contrasting, or we are, we have had several act uh, judicial activity to analyze the statements from the FARC, and we have a lot of judicial activity to, cons co to organize the information from the victims. At this point, is the, the macro case is advancing, and recently we did the, the first indictment focus in a territorial case in Cauca, with the, um, not with the most responsibilities uh, in the context of the secretariat of the FARC, but the most responsible, the most responsible in the context of uh, particular um, units from the FARC in the Cauca. And we began with this indictment, and we use some examples even of um, uh, executions of children inside the FARC. Uh, we described some cases in this first indictment. And because of that, we are um, at the beginning of the accountability phase of the proceedings, and we expect to develop uh, more of this um, of the macro case for the future. At the second. Oh. Uh, well, about the question, if it's necessary to apologize in order to get an, to grant an amnesty or in the macro cases. Uh, well, I think uh, since we in Colombia before we had an, another process of transitional justice, one of the lessons that uh, we learned in that process is that apologizing is a personal process. And to accept that apologize is also a personal process. And to measure if that apologize comes from the heart, it comes from a good intention, it's really subjective. So uh, because of that, and because we also knew about other experience in the world, uh, in our process, it is not mandatory or necessary to apologize. For an amnesty, to grant an amnesty, uh, we see like some requirements that the person was from FARC, that the conduct was related to the conflict, and that are uh, actions that can be, uh, yeah, that you can grant an amnesty that are not war crimes or crimes against humanity, that are uh, uh, facts or uh, that were conducted uh, according to IHL, basically, and uh, so we don't ask them to apologize. In the micro cases, uh, in order to get the benefits, what uh, we require is that, uh, well, they accept the, respons the responsibility, they tell the truth, and they are willing to reparate the victims. What has had happened in the hearings is that sometimes the perpetrators want to uh, apologize and to ask for pardon, but they do it on a personal way. We don't require them to do that. Uh, and we know uh, it's difficult to measure it. Uh, we had some complaints from victims in Colombia that uh, when they had been in the hearings, they say, I don't feel it real. I think they are doing this because uh, they will get benefits of it, this. And what we can say to them is we cannot measure that. We cannot go inside the heart of these people and tell if they, it's true or not. But what we can do is we can measure if they are telling the truth and how, um, how account they are, um, yeah, they are accepting the responsibility. Uh, so we try not to do like this moral judgment in our proceedings. I just want to add something, is that I think the True Commission um, had a lot of meetings with the perpetrators and victims, and they apologized, um, uh, but I think that, like Alexandra said, is, is a challenge. Uh, I think it's not just apologize, because that I know for the indigenous people, for example, in Colombia, they think that people, uh, because they say it always in hearings, 
are people that in Spanish we say they say uh, desarmonizadas. Uh, I think uh, I was trying to say Yuri how to say that. He said of the grown part of life. Um, and the indigenous people think, and Afro-Colombians think that they need to find people uh, to, to, to find peace uh, for themselves, and then they can say apologize. See? So it's, I think it's, uh, it's a procedure and it's a challenge to, to the apologize. And to the other question about unions and the association of employers, I, I would like to highlight uh, two macro cases that we are working on the topic. One of the macro cases is uh, the macro cases is the a macro case regarding the political violence against the political party Union Patriotica, the Patriotic Union in Colombia. We have a, one macro case in uh, and a lot of members of uh, unions and uh, associate of um, uh, of workers in Colombia are, were part of the patriotic union and also in macro case number 8 is a macro case regarding uh, politi political violence in the context of the armed conflict associated to the links between um, state officials the army and the police and paramilitary groups. And one of the most important victims in the context of this macro case are uh, uh, unions. And we have uh, been analyzing a pattern of violence against uh, unions in, in as a part of the strategies of the paramilitary groups to take control of several territories around the country. And I think that for the for future peace negotiations, this will be a, a very important part for the uh, for the negotiations. Wonderful. So we have uh, quite a few questions. We'll take a, a, a last round of uh, I have five <laughs> questions, I think. So please go ahead. All right. Um, thank you so much for coming. This is uh, very exciting. I lived in FARC territory, but in Ecuador. So. Mm -hmm. um, in the Amazon region, uh, on the Ecuadorian mm -hmm. side, and uh, and that's why I wanted to go into law. So your work is very very important. Um, one of the questions I had uh, when I was speaking to victims when I lived—I mean, this was in 2016—there was a blurry line between who was a victim and who was a perpetrator. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm wondering how that is balanced in your judgments. Um, and then another follow-up question to that is about the indigenous communities uh, who were victims but also first forced per perpetrators in some ways. And my question there is, what is the state doing concretely other than reparations in terms of uh, apologies? Are there monetary kinds of responses to kind of preserve the cultural losses that occurred? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maria Rodriguez, and I'm an alumni from uh, from McGill Law. So I'm very. I'm also Colombian, so I'm very grateful that this event is happening here. Very happy for McGill. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, what is your? What do you think is the perceived legitimacy of the HEP in Colombia in the society, given that there's a great fraction of Colombian society that has resistance to the work of the HEP, and kind of related to that. What do you think are things the HEP can do to kind of dispel some of the myths or misinformation regarding the work of the HEP and regarding specifically that they're given amnesty to all the <laughs> guerrilla members, which is not true. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the second question uh, relates to the, the gender perspective or approach that uh, Justice Alexandra was explaining. And I'm wondering, um, since this is very innovative and generally sexual violence or gender-based violence hasn't mm -hmm. been recognized, uh, independently, how are you working uh, to kind of uh, inform the victims that this is a specific kind of crime and that they can self-recognize as victims of this kind of crimes, including, for example, uh, reproductive violence, which is something that is mm -hmm. very, very innovative, but that is not necessarily perceived mm -hmm. as something uh, that, was a, that was a crime and something for which people can be recognized as victims. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. 
Well, thank you so much. My name is Laura. I'm also from Colombia, and I'm very happy to have you here. Um, my first question is, how do you manage with the disagreements that you would have between the victims and NGOs and civil society with the decisions that you made, not the decisions that you take that are subject to an appeal, but maybe some internal decisions regarding participations, events, and other kind of decisions, because I understand that in Colombia, thanks to the participation of civil society, we have this ethnic perspective, gender perspective, but I also know that victims and civil society would never feel that they are, their opinions are taken into account and there's, there's enough participation, there's enough truth, there's enough reparation. So I wonder how do you manage with those critiques? And my second question is how do you manage with the interaction between those territorial cases and those cases that are more focused on crime? Because I imagine there might be some like discussions or like, I don't know, disagreements between of those. So yeah, that would be my, my questions. Thank you. My name is Alejandra, I'm also from Colombia, and I am extremely happy to have you guys here because I'm passionate about constitutional justice and international criminal law. So I have two questions. The first one bounces off um, Maria's question, but it's a more personal question. When you're talking to Colombians, I mean, I have family members who are very much against the um, use of restorative justice approaches, i.e. no prison, um, to deal with these crimes. I'm wondering how you have these personal discussions with people who tell you why are people not going to prison for these crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, again, from a personal perspective, if you can speak to that. And secondly, I'm very interested in how, in your interactions, if any, with the International Criminal Court, I understand that the ICC was very hesitant at the beginning of the peace talks to accept mm -hmm. sanctions that didn't include prison mm -hmm. sentences. But they waver and they're like, yeah, we're gonna support this agreement from what I understand later on. I'm wondering, how those interactions continue, and if you know of any discussions about this approach being used in other, in the context of other conflicts that are also under the jurisdiction of the Rome Statute. Thank you. All right, one last question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, well, my name is Juan Pablo. I'm from Colombia too. <laughs> uh, well, my concern is more about uh, like the diaspora, the Colombian diaspora. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that we don't like you don't talk uh, about the diaspora, but as maybe we know, uh, we're more than five or six million Colombians. Uh, okay. The migrations started like since the uh, the conflict, the inter conflict. Uh, we don't know. Nobody knows who how many Colombians are outside the country, and I will say I don't know. Uh, mostly of the Colombians outside, they're victims. Uh, like people from the uh, Union Patriotica mm -hmm. or people like they were social leaders and how Alexandra say, I guess, uh, uh, 10 million of victims uh, there in Colombia, probably of Colombia we have families or we are victims uh, of the conflict inter. So my question is like, uh, how the hell uh, could like help or listen to the victims that they're outside the country, outside Colombia and how they can be like repair. Okay, thank you. Can you give us one minute to decide who is going to answer what? <laughs> we, we don't have a whole lot of time left. No, so. I know, I know. Um, Yuri, you should answer the questions. Participation. Ten points. It's like a real deliberation between judges. That's what it looks like. Rapid judgment. Um, okay. Uh, there is a lot of questions. That's good. <laughs> I think we are trying to to answer all the questions, but um, that you know we have a lot of challenges 
are in the implementation of the special jurisdiction piece. Uh, I think uh, Oscar is going to talk about, for example, the legitimation that we have uh, in the country. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, for example, the question about the perpetrators and how they do as a victims. And I'm going to make a, like an example with the ethnic communities. In the amnesty chamber, uh, we have uh, perpetrators that are, for example, indigenous. And when we identified that we have perpetrators or we have victims that uh, are part of the ethnic communities, we need to identify what communities, for example. Uh, it's indigenous, but you know that in Colombia we have indigenous that for different um, called pueblos. So, uh, we need to identify the authority, the authority of that of that uh, indigenous uh, community, and we need to start a dialogue. We call intercultural and interjurisdictional dialogue because they are judge uh, of the of the indigenous um, uh, jurisdictions. So we talk. Uh, for example, that they know about the case. I think that the first is, is, to, is to take us a, a, a dialogue about the case, what happened. Some of the case, for example, they know what happened, and we say, so please give us the, your version about that, what happened. Uh, sometimes they didn't know, and they just said, we didn't know that the, our, our um, people or this person as part of the guerrillas. We didn't know, so a special jurisdiction of peace made the, the thing that you need to do. So we are not going to participate because we didn't know that. But in some cases they say we know, and please give us the opportunity to make a sanctions. So, and we try to, so we say, okay, we have the jurisdiction in this case, and so we need to dialogue about that, and we need to know what kind of sanctions we are going to make. We listened, and if we listen that maybe the sanction is not satisfied, for example, the victims, so we said, okay, we need to make another sanction.